So that actually the world today is a lot different than it were only like seven years ago. That's just before the financial crisis. A lot of the things that we took for granted, the relationships we took for granted then are not really there anymore. And one of them is uh, the fact that a lot of the economies around the world are really struggling uh, for, for growth and looking for, for new type of growth models at the same time as low carbon opportunities, for example, are, 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 are gearing up and are getting bigger, bigger market shares. So, um, so there is some sort of movement, I, I, I think, here where uh, that emerging where where Ailey's priorities are begin to somehow be connected to, to um, sustainability concerns. And it's not only green economy or new climate economy, it's also things like security, where, for good or bad, Pentagon is the main voice in the US uh, to take uh, climate security uh, seriously. Now, uh, not to dwell more on that, I, I, I would like to ask you all here, um, is this enough, what's happening? Should we forget about the climate negotiations? Is, is this really enough, the, 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 the movements that we see now? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll have and, a and, and, and so, and very short answers, yeah. Fair? yeah I mean, uh, there's, there's no such thing as enough. I mean, we, we start from a situation where um, the number of cops can be counted, not, can't be counted on your fingers any longer. And couldn't, you, know, you need two people, now it's going to be three people. Um, we have a flat intensity of carbon in our energy system. We have uh, the IPCC telling us that the rate of emissions isn't, in, the emissions aren't increasing, but the rate of emissions is increasing. And so, at the same time, we know from, you know, from the very reasons that we discussed here, that the decisions we make now are of enormous importance. So we need to get more people to talk about climate, whether or not climate is on their agenda or not. We need to enable more people, we need to enable finance ministers, we need to enable companies and others who, whose natural territory this is not to talk about it. And we need to set expectations differently. Because, speaking of the lock-in, we are in a curious situation where we have underinvestment even as we have a glut of capital in the world. Mm. One reason is clearly that there's a lot of uncertainty, and I'm not saying all of the uncertainty is to do with this, but one aspect of it uh, is that we don't really have the confidence to invest in the green side of the economy, but then we may also be now saying we should not invest in the brown side. And so there's a need for, to set out in a, clear, in, a, in, a, in a clear direction. And I think the more we can start from existing agendas as a complement to, not a rival to, climate negotiations, the more people will be inside that conversation rather than outside it. I don't disagree with that at all. I, um, Carla, I'd like to maybe turn back to the example you used at the beginning. You, you described how Sweden uh, made decisions decades ago to be choosing its energy system. Yeah, to avoid a lock-in. Perhaps. They had the benefit of, of having access to hydro. Um, other countries have endowments of other fuels, fossil fuels. China, US, India all have very large quantities of coal. And in the past, they may have chosen those for the same reasons that Sweden chose hydropower. So even as they start to demand less of that coal, they may seek other outlets for it. Um, so I would suggest that looking at the supply side may also be warranted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you would have discussed that, the, the, of course, the risk of, of new investments such as the, the, the grand strategy from, from China. Uh, to uh, pave out new infrastructure westward from China that, that could, could lead to new, new demand. Yeah. If I can j just build on that with the bar example that pick on your question, I think it's not so much of enough or not enough, it's this opportunity and the risk. The opportunity side is when you see this, when you compare this to we're still struggling 100 billion climate green, some, some fund, with trillions, trillions has been invested that you do see this is where the money is. So this is where, in that sense, the opportunity lies. And also, as you alluded, and now we at the juncture that we feel, we know how to do this differently. Even the infrastructure, even is, you know, better uh, GDP per capita, we know the alternative ways. I think that's where, but on the other side is people tend to do what they know the most. For example, if something is driven by China, and we like to repeat what we have just achieved, and that has a very dark side. 
but then the question is, for example, I often go to China and people ask, you know, we want to do the one belt, one road green, absolutely. And we want the financial institutions to set the model in the 21st century as the green financing institutions. We want to do treat differently. But then the SEI, like we do a lot of trade research. Mm. So can we, how can we as an organization, you know, feature those understandings to help the Chinese to do the, do the bar more sustainably? Yeah. So th that I think is the question and the challenge for us all. I need to ask a final question because we're approaching the, the end time for this very interesting conversation, which I hope could uh, continue uh, later tonight um, and in the corridors and the coffee break, which we will have very soon. But I, I, I think, you know, it sounds so positive. Uh, there are lots of things uh, that start to align here, possibly between the A-list of heavy political priorities and um, uh, in the mo taking into account more uh, sustainability, would be be better opportunity for sustainability outcomes. But isn't there even isn't there a risk that the sheer notion of this you know, benevolent A-list priorities you know, generating sustainability, isn't that a risk of that being a comfort blanket, you know, the, uh, an illusion that uh, it's enough to optimize the current system and we forgot, forget that the, we really need a very rapid and very transformative change. And I, I, I just want you each to, to, to comment for 10 seconds each on, on, on that. What do you think? Is there a, shouldn't we at all be on this stage discussing this? Well, well I don't know if we should be here, but, but uh, it's not my comfort blanket, uh, the A-list priorities. <laughs> it doesn't do it for me. But uh, I wanted to link back to what Per said before about uh, there being powerful drivers that we can tap into, but we also need to do other things to complement that. And just one of the aspects I think we shouldn't forget about is the sort of planetary boundary type of considerations also the sort of limits to um, also what I talked about before about the rapid consumption increase we have more and more stuff in our houses and uh, yeah so I think um, when you compare the time scales in the the drivers that we've talked about today and the planetary boundaries they're different so they cannot do all for us I think that <clears throat> I think there is a bit of a confusion between uh, improvements, for example, in efficiency in producing a unit of, of something or consuming a unit of something, and the fact that the um, yeah, population in the world is growing, more people are uh, coming to uh, the middle class and have more purchasing power, and so forth. So uh, I think your question is very valid. Whether we focus on optimizing our current economy, like with all these things we are talking about, or we think in a more systemic change, given that there is apparently no limit to our consumption as, a, as an absolute number. We can improve our relative efficiency, but probably in the long term there was, there's a limit, and mm. maybe we should address it as soon as possible. Yeah, so there is a risk to discuss what we're discussing. Any quick last word, because then we close the session. Uh, looking at uh, A-list versus B-list, it, it's as easy to turn them around. And uh, what we found when we went to, to Central Asia was the, the, how, how easy something that you could call as a B-list or water management, will, what kind of implications it will have on, on all kinds of A-list, on, on jobs, on trade, on, on, on security. And uh, the, simply that kind of dichotomy is not... It's, they're already there, we're facing yeah. the, 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 yeah. these problems that we may face in the future. Yeah, exactly. yeah? And, yeah. and similar as the first example you gave on the Swe Sweden, how they chose hydro and nuclear. Uh, inversely, Central Asia chose the easy part and focusing on, on fossil fuels while having the, the huge potential on developing hydro. And now there, is, uh, there, is, there are tremendous security issues with uh, stronger uh, powers uh, down below, for example, Uzbekistan are threatening with war if, if the countries that have the hydro potential to develop them. So even if you would like to do it right now, it's much more complicated. I think time is up. We